Hey there friends, Martin here and welcome to the fourth part of this series where we will finally import our character to Blender. Before we start working in Blender, I would actually point out one important thing that I forgot to mention last time. To be able to export the look at parameter that we created in the previous part, you actually need to bake your animation. And to do it, you just select this whole area of our animation in this collect clip layer and then choose this add to motion library. And in this pop-up menu, don't forget to check the constraints here and choose a location where to save your clip and it will create a baked clip of the animation that we created for the character. You just need to import it into your smart gallery. So navigate to the folder where you saved it and load the folder. And you are basically creating a new pack for your custom animations. So name it, choose duplicate to get the data into iClone. And there you have it. You can safely delete the original animation and use this clip instead where the facial animation with the look at parameter is baked in. Export it again with the same settings that we did last time. And this way you will be able to get your look at parameter as well as the animation into Blender. Now it used to be that I imported my model using the import FBX option and then I proceeded to set up my materials by hand. However, ever since the official Reillusion CC Blender Tools add-on came out, it is amazingly easy to import your characters into Blender with everything already set up for you. Uh, you basically just need to download this add-on, install it in preferences just as you would any other add-on. And then from the 3D viewport, just import your character using this button. That's it. And right off the bat, we can switch to GPU rendering for a faster render preview. We can also lower the samples in the viewport rendering. It's not necessary to have nearly as much as we have by default. To quickly add in some lighting into your scene, you just uncheck this checker in here and one of the default HDRIs will kick in. And also watch out to have this transparency number set higher because your hair would show some black fragments otherwise. So let's have a look at this character and we can see that there are a number of problems. The first one is the eyes actually. Uh, if you encounter a problem like this, that the eyes of the character are black, I looked for the reason of this and in the end I discovered that it is in the shader editor and the way the material of the eyes is set up. So let's have a look at it. First you need to select this cornea material and in this tab over here there is the subsurface scale and for our character it is too high. So I lowered it to something like 0 0.005 for both of the cornea materials and it solved the problem. And while we're at it, I actually don't think we need two distinct materials for both of the eyes. Unless you plan really large close up on the eyes of your character, you don't really need two distinct materials for both of them. So I usually just use the left material for both eyes and both cornea objects. Next up, the hair look weird. So we can have a look at the materials as well. And they are automatically set up for us like this to be convenient for editing. And if we want to use these colors in here for the base and end color, just as we did in Character Creator, you first need to activate these two sliders, enable color and the global strength. And then you can play around with the coloring of the ends and of the base and of the highlights and everything. Uh, until you figure out a coloring that's closer to what the original idea was. So browner hair with a little bit of gray hint. By the way, if you remember, upon the export, we checked the uh, unify all of the beards and brow elements into one object. So it is here. And all of the materials for the various parts are in here. The same functionality with the coloring of the base and the ends and the highlights applies to them as well. So we can choose this brow material, for example, and start playing with the colors as well to make it a little darker because again, it was too white for my taste. One of my previous videos focused on this topic actually expand on this so you can watch it as well. Uh, the link should pop up right now. 
What I usually do at this point is also to switch from the random walk to random walk fixed radius. The Blender documentation says that the fixed radius type of subsurface scattering is actually meant for thin objects, uh, but I somehow found this to be a better method for simulating subsurface scattering of a skin. Uh, so you can try it out and switch all these materials in here for the body and see whether the results are more to your liking. You can also test how your character looks in Eevee, it should work fine. In this real-time mode though, we have an opposite problem with the eyes, they are actually too bright now. And that is even with the ambient occlusion turned on. So what I usually do when I know that I will be using Eevee for my characters is just adding a simple RGB curves before the base color node to make it a little darker like this. And I do the same thing for the cornea material. So these are the initial shader operations that I do upon importing my model into Blender. And next thing we can look at is the animation and appending some stuff onto our character. When you click on your armature and go to the timeline, in the pose mode, you can see that we have all these keyframes in here for every single bone on the character. That's because we baked our animation before export and it made a keyframe on every single frame of our animation. But we don't need all of those. A lot of them repeat and are just unnecessary. Fortunately, there is a way to clean all this by going into the graph editor, you can do it quickly by hitting control tab in timeline window and here you can choose this option. After the keyframes are cleaned, you can see that the duplicates and the keyframes that are not necessary for the animation are deleted and often this improves the performance of your animation in the viewport. Let's actually switch to shaded view because in Eevee it will be slow anyway uh, and yeah, the animation looks okay. Since I want to be appending stuff onto my armature, uh, what I also like to do is to go to the first frame, select all of the keyframes on the armature and shift them one frame to the right. The easiest way to do this is to zoom in very close and then with all of your keyframes hit G and shift your mouse slightly to the right. I reset a pose with this command and in the viewport hit I and keyframe available. And this way on frame one I have this neutral pose onto which it is easier to append various clothing and armor. Definitely easier than if you had variously rotated limbs and different body posture. The next thing I want to show you is how to create a simple tunic that you can have over these boxers here. I will not go into too much of a detail, but uh, basically you just select the body of your character, go to edit mode and roughly select these polygons in here. The goal is to select part of the arms, part of the legs and without the neck. And then after you're done selecting, you hit shift D to duplicate the faces and P to separate this duplicate from your body mesh. Let's quickly take this new geometry and delete all of the body materials from it before we forget and create a new simple shader with a black color. And to differentiate it in the viewport as well, you can slide down here to the viewport display and make it black too. Now it is completely identical to the body mesh, so it actually goes through the surface of it. But we want to raise it above the surface of the body, which you do in the edit mode, selecting all vertices with A and then Alt S and drag to basically inflate the whole clothing part. This way we have created a simple copy of the body that will move with the character's animation, but we can now change it to make a tunic out of it. Actually to see it better, let's make it rather a dark gray in here because when it was completely black, you couldn't see a thing on it. And now let me show you how to quickly change the shape of this bottom in here uh, to make it an actual tunic. So first hide the boxers and we will start by deleting these faces in here. So hit Alt R to select this edge loop. And then Ctrl plus to grow the selection and delete the faces on the inside of the legs here. 
And now it's all about connecting this space so it's not trousers, but a tunic. Remodeling and remeshing is not really the topic of this tutorial, so I will not go into too much of a detail. But basically I need to make a hole in here and connect these two sides together uh, so that the topology doesn't change in any significant way in here. One tip that I will show you. Filling a space like this is actually as easy as deleting all the faces where the topology is changed and then enclosing this whole area dividing this large face with the same number of faces that you have up here. So control R and add in nine edges. And then finally, alt select this inner edge, which will select the whole edge loop, searching for grid fill command and Blender will do a wonderful job of filling it for you without the need of extruding faces and filling each one by hand. In sculpt mode, you can then very quickly grab and smooth this whole area. When that's done, it's all about doing the same thing at the back here. Uh, we have just five edges here. So fill this area here with keyboard shortcut F, add five cuts with Ctrl R and grid fill again. And we have ourselves a tunic. You can extend this bottom edge here and add some edge loops and it should still move with the character but do not forget to get rid of these shape keys in here. These are actually the remnants of the facial animation in form of shape keys, uh, but we have gotten rid of the face from this geometry and the shape keys are still trying to be applied to this new mesh here. But yeah, it looks strange, so just get rid of them. When you do that, all seems to be working properly. So let's get to the next phase of this workflow and that is adding some assets onto the armature. Let me quickly append a collection that I've prepared for all my patrons. Uh, you can get to the patron page of mine and support me there and everybody gets this hoplite kit collection with a shield, some sandals and a cuirass and a simple spear and helmet. And appending this to an armature is actually easier than you think. So let me get to the neutral pose here and place all of my assets roughly on the correct spot of the character. We can in fact hide the hair. I know we spent some time working on the colors for it, but it will not be visible under the helmet anyway. So <laughs> let's hide it and let's place the helmet as best as we can, maybe even scale it up. Let's do the same thing for the shield, but we will definitely improve the placement of the shield a bit later when we get into the animation pose. Next up the cuirass. Uh, we can rotate it and place it so it follows the shape of the body a little better. The sandals. And finally the spear, which again we will place much better at the point when we activate the animation again. One thing I recommend doing for spears is actually going to edit mode and pushing their geometry for this origin point to be at the place where the center of balance of the spear would be, which is around here. Now it's as easy as selecting your asset, then shift selecting the armature, hitting control tab to switch to pose mode and selecting a correct bone to parent to. So for the cuirass, it is this spine to bone and then hit control P and choose this bone option. Yep, that's it. And now just do it for all the other objects. For the shield, it's this carefully hidden forearm bone in here. You may click several times to find it. Uh, then there is the helmet and we parent it to the head bone. It is hidden too, but you can actually alt click on this area over here and it will show you all of the overlapping objects in that place. You choose the head bone and control P parent it to it. The same thing goes for the spear. You, you parent it to this hand bone and the sandals to the bones on the feet. And now everything should be moving with your armature. Well, it does. But now we have to go through a process of adjusting all this to not intersect each other and basically to polish the placement of everything. 
Of course, if I had everything measured perfectly to fit every single character I create in Character Creator, uh, this would not be a problem. But uh, usually what I do is just push stuff around to adjust it to the character's mesh. And I even add in new shape keys and go inside of edit mode to change the shape for everything to fit better. The advantage of these shape keys is you can always deactivate them and return to the default shape of the object. So at this point it's a lot of pushing and pulling around with the proportional editing active. Uh, so I'm gonna speed this process up. Rendered in Eevee, the character looks like this. And when we switch to cycles, uh, we can see that it's still working very nice. So yeah, this was a very basic setup for my characters for Heroes of Bronze overall. Of course, this character is not at the same quality level as other ones that I've created for the short film. So in the next lesson, I will go a little deeper and show you some extra steps that I always do to improve upon this result. So yeah, see you next time in the last part of the series.